Hi there, my name is Stephen Heron. I'm here with Town Meeting TV. In celebration of Batman's 85th anniversary year, uh, I'm, I, I have very special guests with me and I want to get right in. Uh, 48 year long career in the Senate, twice President Pro Tem, Senator Patrick Leahy. Senator Leahy, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Stephen, it's nice to be here. I, I get interviewed by a lot of things, but when you called and said you want an interview on this, I couldn't say no. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very delighted to hear that because um, obviously a very impressive tenure such as yourself and, and this character is something that you've been tied with into within the culture, but uh, to my knowledge and to my research, there's never been an in-depth interview just about Batman. No. And I, I'd love to, to get your insights on the, on the character and his well, longevity in the culture. Yeah, I'm happy to. I, I, I was fortunate that I, I started reading at a very early age. I had my uh, first library card when I was four years old. And, but I, I would read books, but I would, you know, I grew up in Montpelier. I knew what day Batman would arrive in the, uh, in, in the local store. It was, uh, I think, 10 cents at first and went up to 12 cents. Of course, a lot more now, but. I'd be there to buy the latest uh, Batman book, and by the uh, end of the third grade, I'd read all of Dickens, uh, all of uh, uh, just about Hemingway, and and all these others. But I also read every single Batman comic book. Is was there something about the Batman comics of those times that? excited you in a, in a similar way? I, you know, there's a lot of similar themes, especially with Dickens, between Dickens and, yeah. and Batman. Dickens frequently dealt with orphans and had these very adventurous stories and these, you know, he delved into London in a similar way of, of I, Gotham. I, I think I could find uh, uh, things there. Of course, I was also reading Mark Twain, but, but uh, with Dickens, it did click. You're absolutely right what you what you said. And I like the fact that here was somebody who had no superpowers. He had to use his brains. He obviously physically was very adept, but uh, he had to use his brains. And that really appealed to me. He couldn't just fly off and and all. And all my friends were reading Superman and I was over the corner of reading Batman. Now, Montpelier of the, the 40s and 50s is, is a very different place than that of <laughs> Gotham. Yes. This, this sprawling um, sort of lurid metropolis. Was there something about those comics that created a sort of escape from the world that you were living in at the time? They let my imagination go far. I, I I'd had, in some ways, a disadvantage. I was born basically blind in one eye. So it made it uh, difficult doing sports, which required depth perception. But it, it, uh, I could escape to do, I could do anything when I'm reading. Mm -hmm. I could be anybody I wanted to be, you know, when you're a four-year-old, five-year-old. Uh, I remember going down to the library and my parents said, you've already read this book? Mm -hmm. She asked me a question about, well, here's two more. Mm -hmm. I'd be back a few days later. I just. It allowed an escape world, but the uh, the Batman was truly uh, a world to escape it. Yeah. And I think I think that leads to an example of a of a hero who had to learn how to use his brain. I mean, yeah. there's not many people who have read all of Dickens by the time they're ten years old. <laughs> well, and, and and Mark Twain, and yeah. you know, and uh, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. But your imaginations go wild. It actually, turned out to be an advantage for me because. They said, well, we're not going to have you bother with fourth grade. You just go straight to fifth grade. And the cumulative effect of that, I graduated from law school younger than most people and could start practice and be state's attorney and everything else here in Vermont mm -hmm. at a younger age. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of my one of the other things I was curious about, you know, from your, your role as a Chittenden County state's attorney all the way through to, a, a, you know, 
uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee. You have had a relationship with the criminal justice system and, and to a sense have self-mythologized yourself as a, a crime fighter to an extent. Is, had Batman had an influence on your own relationship with the criminal justice system at all? I don't know if it did or not. I, I have to imagine somewhere in the back of my mind, but I enjoyed being a state's attorney. I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'd go to crime scenes at three o'clock, mm -hmm. two o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I, I want to see justice done. Yeah. And especially when cases where you'd had a molestation of a child or abuse of, of a spouse, I, I would take a very strong personal interest in that and make sure that a justice was done. And it, uh, and I enjoy trying cases, but um, the criminal justice system all, always appealed to me. I, I uh, uh, somebody was sad lecturing about law enforcement. I, when I was in the Senate, and I said, how many murder cases have you tried? Mm -hmm. How many murderers have you personally arrested? And then we had the funny ones, like the uh, police came to our house in Burlington one Saturday afternoon and said, the bank had been robbed, one of the banks had been robbed in South Burlington, and they needed a warrant from me right away. I said, well, when did that happen? About 20 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how'd you find the person so soon? I said, well, he handed a demand note, said, I got a gun, fill this bag for our, with money, I'll shoot you. I said, yes. He wrote the note on the back of one of his deposit slips. I said, this is going to be one of my easier <laughs> cases. Uh, I'll go with you when we serve the warrant. They go in, here's the guy sitting on his couch, he's got the money all piled up, neat piles, and the bank's bag. He said, how did you find me? And the sergeant said, because you're stupid. <laughs> Not all the criminal cases no, are that easy. No. They weren't all that easy for Batman either. No, no. But there, in your memoir, you do recount um, times when you were on trial and, and someone was convicted and, and they, you know, a recount with a, I'll get you someday, Leahy, which yep. I'm sure is very intimidating in the moment, but also feels very r recalling of something that the Riddler or the Penguin might say to Batman. Yeah, I, uh, we were always we were always careful. I had back when I had landlines, we had one line for the police, um, a special line, yeah. and then our listed home phone. But I turned the listed home phone, turned the bell off at night, yeah. so we could get some sleep, and. I did have a number of people, I'll get you. Yeah. When I get, on the other hand, I saw one guy once with a lay stick on his car, and I recognized him, somebody I had sent to prison. I said, I don't want to talk you out of the support, but why? Mm -hmm. He said, well, I was guilty. You treated me fairly. I figured, boy, if I had connections, I wouldn't have been charged. And I'd been there a couple of days in the cell next to me. They put in a well-known lawyer. Mm -hmm. Uh, big in the Democratic Party. Yeah. And then two days later, a, a business leader. And you prosecuted both of them. And so I said, well, he's a mean SOB, but <laughs> he's fair. <laughs> I said, I don't think I'll use that for, for a campaign slogan. <laughs> But it puts a chip in your step, and, and, it, and it demonstrates the scales of justice that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, and I thought, um, you know, Batman, and I realize there's a huge difference between trying cases, you're following the law, yeah. knowing all the Supreme Court cases were coming down at the time, like Miranda and Mapp and so on. But uh, he was always looking for justice, and he was usually looking to help somebody who wasn't getting justice. And I felt that way. Absolutely. Now I I, I, I got to admit the the uh, I've been teased about it over the years. In fact, I don't know if they'll show this, but there's a poster here behind me, and um, it uh, this was a cartoon that was in um, uh, Roll Call magazine, 
when I announced that I was going to leave office because everybody assumed I'd just run again and would have had easy re-election, but Marcel and I wanted to go home. And so they put this, that must be the signal for Senator Leahy to come home. I had more senators in both parties ask me if I would autograph their, their copy of the magazine and, and doing that. Uh, even the president teased me about it. He said, we should have turned that light off. I wanted to keep you here. <laughs> But it's a it's a it's a very moving tribute, and it's a very it's a very lovely image, and I think it speaks to your your tie, and and not only you know the longevity of the Batman character, but the the admiration that folks had for the longevity of your career and the impact you made. Well, and I took it seriously. Could I talk about the landmine thing for a moment? Absolutely, that's that's what I wanted to talk okay, about next. This, this, is, uh, this is a special edition, uh, Death of Innocence. It's become a collector's item. I know you have a copy. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you know, I wrote the introduction. Preface. But I was, I was try, trying to pass a ban on the export of landmines. No country in the world mm -hmm. had ever passed a law to ban the export of landmines. I've been to so many uh, areas around the world where landmines are used. My, my wife is a medical surgical nurse. She's gone in and seen the operating rooms, seen everything they do. And it's horrible. It's always, it, it, it's not so many combatants, it's innocents, it's children, it's others who died the landmines. And I said, why don't we work at banning landmines? And, and the book is very, very uh, tough. It, has Batman going to rescue this little girl who's a daughter of somebody who worked for Wayne Industries in, uh, in a uh, combat area. And the, he would, um, and it shows him walking through the jungle with terror in his face because he has no idea whether he's going to step on a landmine or not. And that made it very clear to people the terror in that. And he rescues the little girl. The helicopter is coming to pick him up and we, we negotiated for several days on this ending and we all agreed on it. And the helicopter is coming to pick him up and the little girl says, look at the pretty toy. And he goes, no. And she grabs the toy and of course it's a landmine and she's blown up to pieces. And our point was there are no happy endings in landmine. So I, I bring my legislation up and they tell me there's no way it's going to pass. Might get seven or eight votes in the Senate. I brought this, this uh, death of innocence to every single senator, Republican, Democrat, across the spectrum. I said, read it as a personal favor to me, read it. They said they thought that I might get seven or eight votes. The day of the vote, every single Senate desk had that on. The bill passed a hundred to nothing. The first time any legislature in any country in the world had passed a ban on landmines. And the Republican leader of the uh, committee in the House was impressed by that enough. He had first been opposed to it. He said he read that book, had tears coming down his face. He said, we'll pass your law. And then uh, Italy was the next one. They actually named it the Leahy Law in Italy. But we were trying to bring out, there's no happy endings in landmines. We use the Leahy War Victims Fund all over the world uh, for landmine victims. In fact, the first aid that we gave to Vietnam after the war uh, with the strong support of President George H.W. Bush, first President Bush, uh, we set up a, a uh, things for landmine victims. They're getting wheelchairs for the first time. And I remember how moving that was being there. And uh, at, at the thing I could see one man 
very slight man, very distinguished looking though, but no legs. He's just staring at me. I thought, God, he must hate this American who destroyed his legs. They asked me to pick him up and put him in his wheelchair. I picked him up, put him in the wheelchair, I started to get up, he grabbed my shirt, he pulled me down and he kissed me. And every time I've gone to Vietnam since, they've had the picture of me picking him up. And it moved the two countries together, but more importantly in my mind, it moved people to have a life. And these were and these were victims and civilians that had no justice on their end. They had no justice on their end, and they probably, in, in all likelihood, mm -hmm. it was an American landmine. Yeah. And now we have programs, uh, effective programs throughout Vietnam that have uh, helped people with that, but in other countries too. And it's, I, I look at what's happening uh, now in, uh, in the Ukraine, for example. I mean, it's terrible what's happening. What's happening in Gaza. Um, it's civilians who suffer. Uh, of course, military suffer, but it's civilians, innocent civilians, who had nothing to do with the war. I, I visited a woman, in, a young woman in Bosnia, um, who had been in the war started. Her parents sent her to a safe place. The war ends. She's coming back, and she's walking down the road. She sees her parents across the field. She runs toward them and has her legs blown off. I mean, it, and the war's over. The trouble with lion mines is that they are there for years and years, sometimes decades afterward. We're still uncovering uh, lion mines from World War II in Europe. But in these other countries, in, in Africa and Middle East and elsewhere, they're there. So anyway, I, I, love, I love Batman. I don't want me to be too serious, but we use this. And then we're trying to think, well, can we do this to instruct in these combat areas? And I'll give uh, uh, DC Comics credit. They knew we couldn't use Batman because too many of these places had seen the, the killers come in with a black mask on and shoot their family right in front of them. So they gave Superman. Was it? Superman and Mickey Mouse were the two American things best known there. Mm -hmm. And Superman would instruct them how to watch, how to learn uh, where the landmines were. And these were comics designed for civilians, particularly children That's in right. the area, translated in their countries. This is countries and, like and Bosnia and... Bosnia and so And what they would do is, you know, they, in a comic book, it's got like the little balloon where the mm -hmm. words are. They just put, which language? What's the language, the prevalent language in the country where it's going? And it just yeah. popped in that. And they do donated thousands upon thousands upon thousands of those. And we figure they saved a lot of lives. But what makes it distinct from death of innocence, and I, I do want to ask you more in depth, because in your preface, it ends with a call to action to contact you and your office. You left your email and your address and your phone number. And it also ends with a call to action for folks to call their various senators and the representatives at the time. This had a very distinct um, Oh. domestic and, and American <laughs> intention and I was wondering and this and this seems like a very unique sort of crossover between the American popular culture and a, and a legislative impact is did you do you feel that there's there's something about this message getting across in a comic book form in particular that allowed a doorway into a, a tough subject that might be more difficult to get across in another oh, form we didn't know whether it work I thought it might but, uh, you know, I've always had a fascination mm -hmm. with, with Batman, and, and it turned out it worked enormously. Mm -hmm. I said, start off with a dozen votes, 
in the Senate, you end up with 100, mm -hmm. every single senator, across the political spectrum, read, read that, uh, and read that, and it really affected them. Could you do that in everything? Of course not. And it may have been just once, uh, once in a time, but it was the time that counted. And one of my proudest legacies is what I've done in landmines uh, around the world. We still have uh, people who thank me for landmine works, but a whole lot of other people have too. And uh, they, I admire so much the men and women I've met over the years who go and spend years in area to help people clear landmines. Um, one of the most notable, of course, was Princess Diana. And I, um, I told her so many times how much I admired her doing that because I knew the places she was going and I'd tell her, you know, those are dangerous. She said, well, they tell me, they tell me how to walk. <laughs> Patrick, and I said, well, okay. <laughs> Be sure you follow the way they tell you to walk. And it, some of the classes we set up for children, you, how you walk, what you look for, and all that. But I know Marcel and I have gone to so many places, these schools and whatnot, and the kids are there with one leg or no legs, and the you got a five dollar, ten dollar device and ruins somebody's life. Uh, and indiscriminately, they're horrible things. They should be outlawed everywhere in the world. Not Batman. I'm <laughs> talking about the. Uh, the landmines. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very curious because there's not much writing about it. Is this an idea that you approached DC Comics with? Did yes. they approach You approached them. I approached them. Yes. I had written a couple of things for them. And um, we started out with a kind of a humorous thing. We've been talking about something with their uh, editorial people is on a different issue. No. Bad man came up and I said, well, and they said, never done this. I said, no, no, no. You go back in the spring of 1946, about the fourth page in, and he's doing that. I said, yeah, okay, Senator, thank you very much. I can hear him going back, where the hell does he think he is? They went in their archives, they pulled it out, there it was. So that started, we started talking, that's when I wrote the uh, introduction. <clears throat> anthology, but <clears throat> they said, anything we could do to help you. I said, as a matter of fact, and we started on this, and we had a lot of people that joined us, and it, we didn't know if it'd work, mm -hmm. but it was a thing, there had been so many briefings on landmines, and you know, I, have, I probably had files like this. This is what hit people, mm -hmm. and you know, Marcel and I, we've gone to a lot of these landmine areas. She's, as I've seen the, the victims and um, my point to them, there are no happy endings. Mm -hmm. Don't look for a happy ending. And, and the writer of the, the book itself, so the book is formatted with your full words, the actual comic book, and then a, a, a collection of essays from people both former military and, and civilians who had been affected by landmines. But the book itself is written by Denny O'Neill, who's a legendary DC writer who frequently focused on socially conscious comics. He's a very famous run uh, for the viewers at home, some context of. He's one of the nicest guys in the world yeah. to talk with. Yeah. And, but he, w he frequently incorporated real social issues into That's his right. work. So it's a, it's a very nice pairing of subject and, and artist. Which is. And you, you put your finger right on it with that. You can lecture on a social issue and everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. You work it in the way you were describing it as Dennis <clears throat> does. Then people are like, oh, wow, did you know this? 
What do you think I've been trying to tell you? <laughs> but it's finally there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's good. An emotionally resonant moment. I, I want to, because I'm, I, I want to loop back, and I'm I, because I, I love the story, the anecdote of you saying it was like, no, in this issue, the, there was this incident, and the DC Comics pulling it um, from their archives. Is there a moment from a Batman comic that stuck with you to a point that the memory may have affected you or brought back to you during your life or your career? No, uh, just sort of a, you know, Batman is not always su successful. Yeah, and. Uh, there, some of these you can go back and he's like, I failed. Yeah. And people do. Yeah. Uh, but it, you try. No, I think the, the Batman, I never knew Death of Innocence would be this effective. Mm -hmm. When we first started talking about it, and I remember uh, Dennis O'Neill had a, just some sketches, it's amazing, you see, it goes like that. He's got a sketch where, yeah, that does it. And as it came to life and death, um, realized we had something. This is probably, I, I would say that of all the uh, Batman things, Death of Innocence is the one that sticks in my mind the most. Not because I was involved in putting it together, but just the horrific message it has. And it mixes a, a boyhood passion with, uh, with, a, with an adulthood um, crusade. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, maybe it seems silly reading the comic books, but those, those I would. And uh, I remember this little store in Montpelier where I grew up in the, uh, I knew exactly what day they got their Batman covers. I come walking in, and a wonderful woman who uh, ran it, she'd see me come in the door. <laughs> she'd reach out and say, here, Patrick, I have my dime or my 12 cents or 20 cents as it went up. And mm -hmm. It's kind of fun. It makes an impact. I want to I want to transition to something a little bit lighter. <laughs> you uh, are forever tied with the Batman in your various cinematic cameos uh, across five feature films and, and one episode of the animated series. F through my thorough research, to my knowledge, you are the actor that has appeared in the most individual Batman films out of anyone. You beat Probably. Michael Goff and Pat Hingle, who are in four, the Burton Schumacher films, and, and Ben Affleck appeared as Batman four times. I didn't but, know that. Yep, and yeah. you're, you have five plus an episode of the animated series. I think that makes you the, the rounding champ. We have a, we have a, a collection here. <laughs> this is Batman and Robin. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. Well, there's you in the animated series. Yeah, well, that one, uh, the voice I used in that one, I remember one of our grandkids were little and said, why are you talking so funny? <laughs> Play a territorial government. There you are in BVS playing a senator, yep. um, fictional Senator Purrington, yep. with another Academy Award winner, Holly Hunter. Yeah. And uh, ooh. of course, there you are in The Dark Knight in a yep. very. Now I have to say, uh, Senator Leahy, I don't know what is more audacious: them holding a knife to you <laughs> in The Dark Knight or blowing you up in BVS. Well, uh, somebody asked me about. Well, you got blown up in that. And I said, but you have to understand, Marcel's a nurse. <laughs> she had me back together and walking within within a week. But um, and the money from it went to the library. Of course, that's the nice thing about it. Mm -hmm. Every single cent that I made from that has gone to the Children's Library in Montpelier, the, the Kellogg Hubbard the Library. Kellogg Hubbard, and it makes you know, I feel good because I go in there and I see young youngsters reading. I even volunteered one time reading hour with these four, five, six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, somebody handed me a note that Batman's enemies had hidden their pictures in the library. I couldn't figure out the clues. I grabbed my cell phone and I said, you nearby, I need help. Door opens, bursts of smoke or noise or whatever. In walks Batman. And you know, Warner Brothers had actually sent somebody with the suit as a local actor. He couldn't figure out the clues, but the children did because they had read enough things. 
And so on the way out, he thanks them. And they're like, oh, you're welcome, Mr. Batman. <laughs> and we, he and I were both trying to keep a straight face. But the, but the thing is, and, and I told this with our kids and with our grandkids, read. Yeah. If you want to read comic books, read comic books. But you'll read real books, too. Yeah. And when I was a prosecutor, I don't know the number of times we went to a house with a search warrant because of a crime of some sort. And I started noticing none of the places I went in had a single book, magazine, or anything. Kids have to learn to read, and they have to love to read. So I don't care if they're reading comic books or what they're reading, but read. And, and there are studies that show that if you have any sort of literature or books at home, it, it doubles or triples the chance of likelihood of literacy within... That's right. Within, yeah. And, uh, you know, my, my father had to leave school at the age of 13 because my grandfather died as a stone carver in Barrie. But he became one of the best taught, self-taught historians. He just read constantly and urged us to. Um, my mother, her parents immigrated to Vermont from Italy, and she grew up speaking Italian and, and English. But she read, everybody read. And Marcel and I do that with our kids. We say, read, read, read. And uh, we loved it when our grandkids were little. They'd be up with us at our farmhouse in Middlesex, and. Um, they come down to the library, check out a pile of books, and they'd be reading them in the back seat of the car on the way back up to the uh, farmhouse. Uh, if if you read, and enjoy reading, everything else comes together. Now, I must admit, uh, reading Batman is a little bit easier than reading Tolstoy. Yeah. <laughs> But it's all a stepping stone. I actually, uh, comic books are how I learned how to read. So this is, so I, you, I, you, I concur with I'm you. preaching entirely. to the converted. To the converted, absolutely. But, you know, and you remember. The thing is, if you're reading and you're, you're first reading, you're, you're remembering what you read and why you read it. Uh, I just, I just think it's a, it's a great experience and I, I'm delighted on this that we're able to do something on the um, on the landmines. Yeah. Yeah. I still have other places in you know, combat areas in the world. I've been. People say I saw your Batman comic. That's an impact, and that's I mean that's the that's the cultural significance of the character. He crunches he crosses borders, and in a way yeah. that that's and that's very, why very with, with what's happening in. In Gaza and Ukraine right now, it just tears me apart uh, because this has got to stop. It is. I mean, the Batman book is Death of Innocence. Well, look at the thousands of innocents who are dying now. It's got to stop. And it's not as, as easy to solve as it is in fiction. No, no, it's not, it never is. The, uh, but you've obviously <laughs> done your homework more than anybody else. I, 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 well, I was, I was telling this to your, to your lovely wife, Marcel, and, 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 uh, but uh, my mother's a, a school teacher, and I'd be doing her a disservice if I didn't do my homework for an opportunity like this. And, and I... I Senator, this has been a thrill and a, and a joy, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss with me. There is there is one thing um, that I want to get to while you're you're in this seat as a, a an elected official, as someone I would want to ask. Um, you know, and your experience as a senator, someone who is a, a key figure in the management of a national budget. Uh, do you believe that it is all possible that multi-billionaire Bruce Wayne's fortune could be better utilized? <laughs> Well, actually, you read some of them. Uh, they talk about, they show him as Bruce Wayne, yeah. the playboy philanthropist, yeah. and spreading out billions of dollars. Yeah. And then leaving 
the dinner early mm -hmm. and go to the bat cave and going out to play cards. So as soon as you can do both. Uh, I won't tell the the writers how they <laughs> they should do it. I I do. I, I know a lot of wonderful philanthropists who've given huge amounts of money, and um, I'm impressed that they have. I, a lot of them I have talked with about landmines, and and uh, they have given a great deal of money to landmine victims around the world. So. Um, they're, they're my superheroes, too. That's a great way to go out. Senator Leahy, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. This has been a thrill. And thank you all to, at home for watching. You can find more programming around Town Meeting TV at our website, cctv.org.